In today's politically correct world, the thoughts of revival sweeping the nations seems an impossible dream. Maybe you're standing for a family friend or a loved one, and in today's world, you feel it's hopeless. Christianity appears irrelevant, and it is easy to believe that true Christianity will fail to exist within a few years. But as we will see, previous generations faced similar challenges, and when all seemed lost and they were backed against the wall, His people began to pray and cry out to the God who hears and the God who sees, and He answered with revival. I believe revival is a divine assault on society. In this episode, you will see that when God moves, everything changes. In Judges chapter 6, Gideon asked the Lord, Lord, if you were with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are the miracles our fathers told us about? Maybe you feel the same as Gideon and you feel disturbed. I believe that we need to be consumed with a holy desperation that refuses to give heaven rest until heaven moves. In this episode, we're going to see how God moved in 1859 in the year of grace in Northern Ireland and how everything changed. You know, I grew up in Northern Ireland, and when I heard about the revival, it truly challenged me. How could it possibly be true that such a revival would sweep this nation that is so bitterly divided and then spread into Britain and cause such a great awakening? You know, I remember as a child in the 80s, a tourist coming up to me and asking me, where is your city center? As we looked around, all we saw were bombed up buildings a place where a building once was, and then occasional buildings. And I said, you're looking at it. The reality was we lived in a war zone. Yet, in this nation, God truly moved with power. So join me as we travel to Northern Ireland and actually visit the town of Connor and seek to better understand this revival and how we can experience the same today. Mm-hmm. 
On a country road, as you enter the village of Connor, a sign states, the village of Connor, historic ecclesiastical site. It reminds all entering this small town of the incredible year of 1859. So what happened? In this town, through the power of prayer, the second great awakening in Britain was birthed. You know, it's easy to believe that prior to the revival, that Ireland was filled with people that were on fire for God, burning for and seeking after revival. But the reality is, the opposite was the case. One minister wrote, Here too, says the minister of one of them congregations, our condition was deplorable. The congregation seemed dead to God, formal, cold, prayerless, worldly, and stingy in religious things. Twice I had tried prayer meetings of my elders, but failed. For after the fifth or sixth night, I was left alone. Another account. I felt as if I was almost alone, no one mourning or praying with me. And I told my people I was appalled at their determination to have no prayer meeting and that we would not have a drop of the shower of grace. Now listen to this account. It is not a fact, however, that those who became the subjects of revival were precipitately improving under the means of grace or were in such a state of mind as one might be supposed to invite the presence of the Holy Ghost. On the contrary, as recorded by Dr. Eliot regarding the American revival of 1802, much deadness prevailed. And though there were some faithful among the faithless, prayerful and hopeful, yet indifference had numbered the hearts of many, and ministers were sad. You know, the revival started just like any revival, when people began to return to the Lord God, repent, and do self-searching, letting the Word begin to expose darkness in them, and turning to the Lord God, as I said, in prayer, and crying out in mercy, and as a consequence, the revival was birthed. In 1857, a lady by the name of Mrs. Colville visited Northern Ireland. She was a Baptist lady, and she would go out in the streets, and she would give out tracts and preach the gospel. One day, while in Balamina, she was preaching and giving out tracts, and a lady challenged her on the subject of predestination. Mrs. Colville responded by saying, You do not know the Lord. Another person was in the crowd that day and heard that, and those words pierced his heart. They challenged him for several weeks until finally he received the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. His name was James McQuilkin, and he began to pray and seek the Lord. So James McQuilkin began praying, and he sought the Lord to add to the group, and the Lord was faithful. Slowly the group became four men that would meet every Friday night in a schoolhouse in Kells. These men would see others at it as they began sharing their testimony and converts uh, started joining the meeting. James Wilkokin was greatly inspired by what he heard happening in America and that it all came out of a simple prayer meeting. Armed with this and by the words of Charles Finney and the testimony of George Mueller, he began to get the group to stand on specific promises and to believe God for revival in the north of Ireland. And God heard and God answered. Well, I don't know if you've ever driven uh, down Irish country lanes, roads, whatever they want to call them. They are very narrow and it's very challenging to determine which is the left and which is the right side of the road. Well, as you can see, as we head towards Connor, it is extremely rural. This is not where, if I was God, that I would choose to birth 
a revival, especially a great awakening. But it was here that God did it. And as we look uh, at the churches, the Church of Connor, we just were looking down the street towards Kells. But it was here at the church where the four men attended. And if we went back to 1859, the crowds that began to gather because of the revival simply could not fit into this church building. They were concerned for safety reasons that they started to hold the meetings outside in the streets, in the fields, um, because again, the, the crowds were so large. But what I want you to see is just how rural this area is. God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. This is not how we would plan it. This is not how we would do it. But you know what? We may be a, what we consider a nobody in the middle of nowhere, but God is able. Well, right now we've gone to Kells, and here's a church in Kells. And again, just imagine 1859, this building filled, overflowing to such a degree they had to gather outside in the fields, in the marketplaces. Their prayer meeting began in September of 1857 in a little schoolhouse in Kells, which is across the bridge from Connor. Kells, a small village, is one of the oldest towns in Ireland. It is claimed to be started by St. Patrick and dates to the 5th century. And it was home to a major monastery which was burnt down around the 7th century. Kells actually means monastic cells or churches. During the Christmas time of 1858, one of the converts of the Kells prayer meeting decided to return home to Og Hill and to share the gospel with his family. The convert Samuel Campbell read the word and prayed with them so boldly and powerfully that it challenged the whole family. That night his mother and his sister received the Lord and three weeks later his brother. This caused a stir to spread throughout the region. As a result, James Wilkilkin and two of the original prayer partners decided to go to Og Hill. They were allowed to hold a meeting and share at the Second Presbyterian Church in Og Hill on February 2nd. The local minister was so impressed, but not all were open to the revival. Some did not accept their message and mocked. Two weeks later, a second meeting was held. The result was the number of prayer meetings grew, as did the interest in the subject of revival. Then on March 14, 1859, a special meeting was held at the First Presbyterian Church in Og Hill. The crowd became too large and had to be dismissed out of fear the building uh, could not contain them and it would not be safe for them. It was a cold and rainy day, but 3,000 people gathered who were hungry and a layman addressed them. The man preached with a mighty anointing and hundreds fell on their knees in the streets. An intense sense of conviction gripped the people. This was the beginning of that revival. As one account would write, it was with extraordinary fervor that the movement spread into Og Hill and the other parishes. In barns, schools, and in private houses, meetings were conducted and addressed by the converts and were attended by multitudes of people. The Connor congregation alone would see a hundred prayer meetings held every week. So how did the revival spread? Well, fire begets fire. So let me share with you some of the stories of the revival and how it spread from city to city. You know, when I was a child, we'd often go during the summer to visit Port Rush, a holiday town. Well, in 1859, it was a small town of about 900 people. Yet during the revival, it would see crowds of about 2,000 gathering every day outside. And those crowds grew to 5,000. It's hard to imagine 
such large crowds in such a small town, yet God did it during 1859. Phoebe Palmer, who visited the revival, said regarding what happened in Derry, Londonderry, it was not unusual to see young and old, male and female, standing proclaiming to the astonished and weeping multitudes the power and excellency of saving grace. Ladies of rank had been seen to leave their carriages and with weeping eyes listen to with most eloquent constraining appeals from humble young females in open street and in highways and running to them, embrace them and with flowing tears thank them. Surely these are the utterances of the Spirit as in apostolic days. In the fear of the Lord, she also wrote, we dare not join with those who would neglect or pour contempt upon this remarkable, perhaps eccentric display of spiritual affection. I have long felt that we do not sufficiently familiarize our flocks to the contemplation of the Spirit's characters and his wondrous operation. You know, as I've said, I grew up in Derry slash London Derry. So I want to take you there and share with you what happened in that city in 1859. Well, we've come to the historic city of Derry slash Londonderry, Northern Ireland's second city. It is a town of about two-thirds Roman Catholic and one-third Protestant. So one would ask, how did the revival impact Derry City? Well, in May of 1859, the newspapers began telling the events that were occurring in Connor and Ballymena. People heard about those being struck down under strong conviction and suffering physical manifestations that simply baffled medical science. Fire begets fire. As people heard the news and the stories were validated as true, it challenged them. People began to hold prayer meetings and revival soon reached Derry with the same outward manifestations. Meetings of two to 5,000 were held in the open air multiple times a day and awe fell upon the people as they gathered and the whole population of the city felt themselves under the mighty hand of God. It was reported that it changed everything in this city and many said who may abide in the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth. You know it's easy to believe that revival can occur in small little tiny towns but what about big cities? Well, let's go to Belfast, the chief city of Northern Ireland. Hi. Also in May of 1859, the revival reached Belfast, the chief city of Northern Ireland. At the time, Belfast had a population of about 120,000 people. The revival started when some of the converts from Connor came and ministered at some of the local churches. During the revival, it was reported that in almost every street in Belfast, you would find people either repenting or worshiping God, and that some of the most prominent sinners, drunkards, and prostitutes were saved. The local newspaper reported that this movement was impacting and spreading in all parts of the town, and that interest in the meetings, attendance at them, and the results produced continued unabated. At the local music hall, Ministers gathered and invited the local mayor for prayer daily. In Belfast, like in many other towns and villages, the crowds became too large for the churches and the buildings to contain them. And so they began to gather outside in public. One of the places they gathered was at the Botanical Gardens. The first meeting is said to have had about 15,000 people attend. But those numbers would grow. When Spurgeon came to preach, it said that 40,000 people gathered to hear him during the revival. It was clear that the revival had an incredible impact in this town of 120,000, where crowds as many as 40,000 were gathering at just one meeting. 
As we read of the accounts of the revival, we find out that people became extremely aware of the reality of sin, of hell, and heaven. And when they were touched by the love of the Father, they were so changed, they felt compelled to tell everyone around. Everything changed during the revival. Life became consumed by the revival, and whether you went to someone's house or you walked down the street, all you heard was the revival. People stopped doing business as usual and were consumed with meetings and seeking and hearing about the Lord. Crowds would gather outside of churches so large that it wasn't safe for them to enter the church. There were fears that the church simply could not contain the numbers of people. And so meetings were held in the open multiple times a day. The blasphemies of parties returning from the markets, which had become a public nuisance, gave place to simple but expressive hymns. Before this day of our merciful visitation, Balaki was one of the greatest of Irish villages. Rioting and drunkenness were the order of each evening. Profane swearing and Sabbath des desecration were the most fashionable of sins. And such a place of lying and stealing I do not know. So intense was the desire after the things of God that it was recorded in one district. Whole townlands are awakened, all outdoor labor suspended, and the people and crowds follow the minister from door to door to engage in prayer. At a church in Omaha, it was recorded, truly astonishing and awful, as cries for mercy and salvation rang through the building, literally for hours, neither singing nor audible congregational prayer could be conducted, every heart being so subdued, nor did the meeting close until near the break of day. You know, as we look and hear the testimonies of the revival, it is clear that the Norman life was totally changed. The Holy Spirit had become Lord, and there was a fear of grieving Him, and on everybody's tongue was Jesus and the revival. Life as we know it was utterly changed. Another psalm is sung, and now the converts rush in among friends and neighbors, shouting, pleading, and with heaving hearts, and sparkling eyes and beaming countenances, and in strange sweet tones, telling of their newborn joys. The multitudes heave to and fro like a ship in a storm. And like drunken men in the streets, the people stagger and fall with a shout or a deep sigh. Tears are shed and groans as if from dying men are heard. Prayer and praise, tears and smiles mingle together. Husbands and wives are locked in each other's arms, weeping and praying together, while those who'd come to scoff stand still and in fear and trembling contemplate this strange thing that is going on before their eyes. As I said, there were many manifestations in this revival. Some of them we would consider almost Pentecostal, and among those it was written. Almost immediately throughout the church, parties arose and went out, laboring under deep conviction, and immediately the graveyard is filled with groups singing and praying, almost prostrate bodies of women and men. Some are as in a trance, others crying for mercy. Some are still falling in the arms of friends and sinking as into a swoon. Some stagger to a distance and drop to their knees to pray. A historian wrote, As you pass down the street, you hear in almost every house the voice of joy and melody. Another minister at the time recorded, I feel as if I were breathing the atmosphere and treading the golden streets of New Jerusalem. Well, the revival would spread from Og Hill to Balamina, as news spread of the churches being filled and people falling under the power of God. Balamina, a town of about 5,000 people at the time, was impacted in a very big way. It would spread to Portrush, a town of about 900 people, that saw crowds of about 2,000, which grew to 5,000, gathering daily for prayer. It would spread slowly throughout the nation, and meetings 
of thousands started to occur multiple times a day. Ministers found it impossible to get rest as people came at all hours looking for help and for somebody to explain the gospel to them. Close to um, Colerain is a small town called Limavati. And when the revival reached there, it was written by one historian, the lawn was literally strewed like a battlefield with deeply wounded ones under the conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit who was revealing Christ to their souls. The bars or public houses were empty as people thronged to the meetings. A historian recorded that prayer meetings broke out in every other house. Much like today, people felt reason, logic, and science were the answer to all the mankind's needs and issues. They sought to explain everything by natural means. But this revival challenged man and all his logic. Well, if you've ever been to Northern Ireland, if you've ever watched the news, you will know that every year on the 12th of July, there is a celebration of the victory of King William of Orange over King James. It is a celebration that stirs great bitterness among the Catholics. The Catholics felt that this would be the test to know the revival truly was of God or not. Listen to the accounts of the 12th that year. As the 12th drew near, it had been customary to reinforce the military and police that they may keep the peace, if possible, between the turbulent inhabitants of Sandy Row, Belfast, and the nest of ribbonmen who occupied a neighboring district. Not only had the ordinary street missiles been flung in plentiful profusion on the scene of conflict, but deadly collisions had taken place, shots had been fired, and blood ran on the streets. One minister wrote, when the gracious movement reached Belfast, I joined an organization that had come to the help of the Lord, and the field assigned to me was that very famous district called Sandy Row, and its adjuncts where the people had been taught to catch the Papist birds by throwing stones at them. Yes, the essence of Protestantism and the conversion of the Romanists in that region consisted in abundant brickbats and bludgeons. But the old war cries were now hushed by a higher voice, and in few parts of our beloved land was the short sermon preached, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, than in this very district. The cases of prostration were very numerous, at the mill, in the factory, at the firesides, in the neighboring houses, in the public street, in the prayer meeting, and in fact in every human resort. When revival was at its highest, Sandy Row was visited by persons from all parts of the country, and deed of the kingdom, and on the evening of any similar anniversary, I had performed no ordinary feat to have passed through those districts, but I had no fear. There was no breaking of lamps or constable heads, no fighting. The streets were crowded, but good humor and enjoyment were the distinguishing features of the scene. Another person wrote, Throughout the day, none of the usual emblems of the twelfth appeared. No orange garlands, no arches flung over the streets. The only regret I heard expressed was that the past was so unlike the present. There was no military or semi-military parade this evening. I want to share one man's testimony of the revival, what he said, because I think it really portrays the power of the Spirit moving in this land. And he wrote, Gentlemen, as he trembled, and he wrote, Gentlemen, I appear before you this day as a vile sinner. Many of you know me 
you have to look at me and recognize the prolificate of Brock Shane. You know that I was an old man hardened in sin. You know I was the servant of the devil, and he had led me by the instrument of his, the spirit of barley. I had brought my wife and family to beggary more than 50 years ago. In short, I defy the townland of Brock Shane to produce my equal in prolificacy. So did all agree with the revival? The answer, no. Some churches opposed it, felt that the revival was false, and tried to start their own revival, and only failed. Unitarians were against it, and Roman Catholics tried to stop it. Why? Well, I should say that more Roman Catholics came to the knowledge of Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior in that year than in the previous 40 years combined. But Roman Catholics were very weary of the move for many reasons. The history of Ireland tells the story. The Irish Catholics had suffered great persecution from Protestant leaders. And they saw this as another attempt by Protestants to suppress the Catholic community. We must remember that the Irish famine occurred in the late 1840s. It was a terrible time that resulted in almost one million Roman Catholics being killed and many, many more when they were forced to emigrate and leave Ireland. The Irish population at the time before the famine was around eight million. It would drop to around four and a half, and it has never recovered to the numbers prior to the famine. You have to imagine that Irish Catholics would be unable to take fish out of the local rivers even though they were starving because they did not own the rivers, they were owned by Protestant landowners. This caused a great deal of bitterness and Catholics were forced into workhouses. So it is no wonder that when the revival bro broke forth, that Catholics resisted it. I believe at the same time, the revival was a move of God where God sought to heal the nation and bring to the Catholic people a revelation of His mercy and His love. You know, as we study the revival of 1859, like every revival, we see real fire and we see wildfire. I also, as I look and as I study the accounts of the leaders, I see they were burdened that they truly did not want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Yet a lot of things were occurring that they didn't understand, particularly the physical manifestations. They began at the very onset of uh, rain. Don't go on a fart. You know, as I study the revival of 1859, one of the things we always see in every revival is real fire and wildfire. And as I look at the stories of the leaders, I see they were burdened that they truly did not want to grieve the Holy Spirit. The big area of concern was the physical manifestations. Were they of God or were they not? Some felt they had to be stopped. Others, like one minister in Limavati, noted that when these manifestations were most prominent, more unsaved people were converted and their conversions lasted or stuck. 
The reality is the manifestations were extraordinary. People were struck down by the power of the Holy Spirit as they became aware of their sinful condition and their need for salvation. They began to cry aloud for mercy. We saw other physical manifestations such as people shrieking, people groaning, people truly burdened and just desperate for salvation. We see how people go into trance-like states, people walking as if they were drunk. We also saw people once liberated from their sin and coming to a place of a full assurance of salvation began to be filled with joy and they were compelled to tell the world what Jesus had done for them. So I'll let you make your own decision on the physical manifestations as you look at some of the records and comments made by the leaders. The reality is that, bottom line, they did record there were about three stages in the conversion of most people. First was where they became deeply aware of their sin and they would be slain as if dead. In this state, they would be agonized and would cry out for hours, days, sometimes weeks as they pursued and sought after salvation from the Lord. The second stage was where they became aware of the cross and what Jesus did. And they began to make a stand and claim their right as a child of God and entered the third stage, which was a peace and a joy, which would completely consume them. And out of this stage, they would arise and, as I said, be compelled to tell the world what Jesus did. It was clear that to all the converts, they were fully aware of the reality of their sin and of their need to repent and also the reality of heaven and salvation. Salvation meant something powerful to them such that they could not be silent. They had to shout it from the rooftops. There's so much more we could share about this revival. We could talk about the children and how they were so greatly impacted. And just like their parents, they would cry out and seek God. They would be compelled to share the good news with their fellow students and even with their teachers. And the Spirit of God would turn up even in schools and lives would be changed. Everywhere you went, God was moving in power and lives were being utterly changed. As we look back at the revival of 1859, it truly was an incredible revival that swept souls into the kingdom. Lives were changed. Some of the most prominent sinners, drunkards, and prostitutes came to know the Lord. There was not a house in Ireland that was not impacted by the revival. Every street, whether it was Derry, Belfast, or some small village in Ireland, you would hear people either praying, crying out for mercy, or worshiping God. 
I believe revival is a divine assault on society. I believe that we can experience the same today. The deeper the revival, the deeper the repentance. So there is a call to the church to return and repent. And I believe we must come with him with all of our hearts and we must seek his face. God is not looking for superstars. God is looking for people of the right heart, sold out, surrendered, and consecrated to him. We live in a microwave generation where we believe a quick five-minute prayer fixes everything. As you look at the various heroes of faith, what made them different? Was it where they were born or what family they belonged to? No. It was their prayer life. Prayer birthed power. We can see a revival in this generation if we, the church, would get serious and begin to pray and seek God and stand on specific promises and cry out for this generation. I believe if we could get an orchestra of prayer, of people crying out daily, giving heaven no rest, heaven will move. Because we serve a God who sees, a God who hears, and God who answers. And you know what? Answered prayer glorifies Jesus and glorifies the Father. So I pray that you are provoked. I pray that you are stirred on the inside and that you lay hold of the vision that we need revival, but more importantly, we can see revival if we, His people, will seek His face and cry out in this hour daily. Thank you.